They never lost. Chapter 3 The moist air and the horrid smell, despite these tunnels being decommissioned centuries prior, it seems the smell still lingers, especially after it rains. It is a far cry from the stale air of the prison. The sterile look of the prison reminded him more of a hospital than a prison. Crifter used a towel to cover his mouth and nostrils to somehow prevent the smell from entering with his breaths, but it did little to nothing to prevent the abhorrent stench from invading his lungs. By the gods, how much longer, he asked himself in his thoughts, as he trudged on through the wet tunnels, doing his best to orient himself in that maze. The guard, bless his soul, gave him an old map of the tunnels. He had to stop every once in a while to look at the map and confirm if he is going the right way. It had been more than half an hour since he entered the tunnels, and he was trying to be as quick as possible. Every moment he spent trying to get out of these damned tunnels was a moment wasted on preventing the catastrophe unfolding above. Every moment lost was a life or a dozen lost. His old bones were straining from today's exercise, if you could call it that. All he wanted was to rest. He wanted to end this madness as quickly as possible. As he walked hastily while trying to be discreet in his movement so as to not accidentally trigger any sensors, if there are any down here, he asked himself, what if I am too late? The thought haunted him. If the war started, he could do nothing, nothing that came to mind, at least. As he dwelled on that thought, he turned a corner in one of the countless halls of the tunnels. A light, other than his flashlight, came into sight. Finally, he said out loud. He checked his map once more. This should be it. He walked forward with each step coming closer to the blinding light. He could not see what was on the outside yet. All of a sudden, he saw a silhouette a shadow cast on the entrance. He stopped for a moment, thinking if the person who made it was the one who was awaiting to rescue him, or a person awaiting to imprison him again. Or worse. Despite his paranoia, he continued forward. General Crifter? He heard a voice echo from the entrance. He didn't respond. He continued walking forward. As he approached, he could see the person at the entrance more clearly. It wasn't a guard, not even a soldier. It was a civilian, shabbily dressed. Reaching the exit to the tunnels, he realized immediately that he ended up in the slums. General Kreifter, is that is you? The voice asked once more. Yes, he responded simply. Thank the gods, you made it. I started to get worried, the young light green scaled male said. You're with the soldier, right? Crifter asked. Yes, I'm with Guaradwar, the young man said. I don't know the lad's name, but I take your word for it. Right, we don't have time to waste? He said you've got a transport ship? Crifter asked the young man. Yes, it's under the bridge on the other side, the young man said, pointing in an arbitrary direction. How long will it take to get to the ship, I mean? Crifter asked. Well, uh, five minutes. Ten if we take it slow. We ain't going slow, kid. Lead the way. The young man nodded and started walking down a large pipe. As Crifter followed, he saw that they were right under one of the highways going through the slums. A veritable city of its own was made on the outskirts of the city in less than a few cycles. Ever since his nephew came to power. There were hundreds of smaller ships going above, mostly transports, some civilian. As they walked toward his escape vessel, Crifter asked, Hey! What is your name? Enade Fonk, sir, the young man replied. All right, Enade, who's piloting the ship? You seem too young to have passed the piloting test? Crafter asked. Oh, no, I won't be flying. My brother is the one who's piloting the thing. He was in the fighter pilot's corps but failed the final test. So here he is, Enaid replied. Oh, great, Crifter said, trying to hide his disappointment, though he was aware of the fact that he could not expect some professional to come at a moment's notice especially of taking into account the current circumstances. This plan for his rescue was hatched within hours of his arrest. As he thought about it, if everything goes well, he'll need to vouch for the ones who made this reality. To find out about his arrest, which was covered up in the media, is difficult in of itself. But creating a plan, finding the people to adequately make it possible, and of course executing it professionally, he applauds everyone involved, so no, he is not complaining. Sir, he's a good pilot. Don't worry. Soon enough, they entered a covered up area right after the highway. It looked like a large entrance to another tunnel of some sort. 
He couldn't see anything in that tunnel, but as he got closer, the darkness concealing it almost perfectly was a ship from a long past age. But it looked to be taken care of well, with some minor modifications. As he got a better look at it, he realized something. How did you... I won't ask, actually. Crifter asked in front of him was an old military fighter designed for both atmospheric and space combat. Looking at it was nostalgic. He flew those back in the day. He saw the first prototypes made during the War of Heaven. They were almost as ancient as himself. Does it even fly? Crifter asked again. Pretty sure it does, Enid replied before shouting, Harrier, are you there? After a few moments, some sounds reverberated through the tunnel, sounds of clanking metal. Yeah, is the general with you? The voice replied. Yeah, light it up, he's getting on, Enid replied. The only reply was the sound of more clanking metal. Enid gestured to Crifter to follow him. They ran toward the old fighter. Crifter's legs were burning from the strain. He couldn't wait to sit down. Damn it all, damn it all, I am out of shape, he thought to himself. As he reached the foot of the ship, Enid stopped. Sir, it has been an honor. I am leaving you to my brother, for Frindia. He saluted. Thank you, Enid. Good luck to you as well, Crifter said as he jumped on the wing of the fighter. The fighter turned on, its engines slowly coming to life. He opened up the hatch and sat down into the craft before closing it above him. General Crifter, it is an honor, sir. My name is Harrier Ifonk. Once again, it is an honor, sir. The pilot turned his head. He was slightly older than Enaid, and his scales had a slightly darker green color. Thank you, Henrier. No need for formalities. Let's get going. We've got no time to waste, Crifter responded. Yes, sir. Henrier replied as he pulled a lever, the engines now screaming to life. The fighter slowly lifted off the ground and exited the tunnel. We're going to go through the alleys. We're going on minimal power, so hopefully the drones won't detect us. The patrols are probably increased. They must have realized that you're not in your cell anymore, Henrier said as he typed in some coordinates into a console. I'm taking you to an outpost on the fringes of the slums. They'll help you try and stop this. Henrier continued as he slowly steered the ship into a dark and dirty alley between old industrial buildings turned into improvised housing. He looked down into the industrial sewer. From this view, he knew where he was exactly. The demolished buildings around were bustling factories when he was young. Below, he saw Enaid look at the ship, saluting the ship. The expression he wore was that of uncertainty, but it also had a glint of hope. How long was this outpost online? I wasn't aware of organized resistance to the royal crown? Crifter asked. As Henrir steered carefully between the tight walls of the old alley, he replied, Ever since the death of Emperor Arvinid Gwich, we are certain that it wasn't of natural causes. He was assassinated, and his son, the current emperor, was put on the throne on the whims of a foreign power. Assassinated? Crifter said in disbelief. How? He did nothing but good for this nation. He saved it from certain collapse. I understand your sentiment, sir. We thought the same. In the first months, if you told us that the emperor was assassinated, we would have told you you were insane. But as some information slowly started to leak out, we started to connect the dots. If you weren't aware of that conspiracy theory, well, that also has a reason. There were some shady characters at play trying to cover it up. We lost many good people to them. They were especially careful as to not allow any ideas to pop up in the minds of any of the royal family members, such as yourself, Henrier said. I, I don't understand who would do this. And why is Mab Plentin, my nephew, doing this? Was he manipulated? Crifter asked. I am almost certain, sir. We had theories it could be the Armandians. We had some disagreements with them a few cycles ago, if you remember, but nothing to warrant such extreme action. The humans were also pointed out as being the ones behind it all, considering their history. But as you know, that theory goes down the drain once you take account of this fucking situation. Excuse my language, Henrier said apologetically. A fucking shit show of a situation this is indeed. You said nothing wrong. Just get me there as soon as possible. We might still have time, Crifter said. How foolish was I? Why was I so naive? How could I not think of that? No. It would be insane. There was no possibility of something like that happening. By the gods, I'm sorry, my brother, for failing you like this, Crifter thought to himself. The severity of the situation was now settling in. This wasn't just a war with former allies. Some still even call them that. 
This was something much deeper. As he was lost in thought, Henrier piloted the craft through the alleys of the capital as they slowly inched their way to the outpost. Suddenly, Henrier stopped the vessel dead in its tracks at some sort of intersection of the alleys. What is it? Why did you stop? Crifter asked worriedly. Drones, Henrier said. As soon as he said that, two flying metallic objects crossed the field of their vision, a blue light shining on everything within a 90-degree angle. Just go on. Nothing to see here. Come on, Henrier said under his breath. Three more passed through the intersection. Luckily, none seemed to notice them. Henrier sighed in relief, but he still needed to hold his guard up high. They weren't supposed to be here in such fucking numbers. The info was wrong, it seems, Henrier said to himself out loud. After a few moments of waiting for good measure, Henrier pressed forward. As he crossed into the intersection, he looked to the left and right. After being sure the coast is clear, he continued forward. Just as they were going to return back into the dark alley, they heard a quick string of beeping noises from afar. It could be heard even through the glass of the fighter. Shit, we're caught, Henrier shouted. Just as he finished the sentence, they both heard a loud shrieking sound, soon followed by thumps. The wall next to them exploded, large holes appearing in what was a flat surface. Dust and debris hit the glass of the fighter. Henrier, thinking on his feet and realizing that accelerating in this tight space was a death sentence, the wings nearly touching the walls, was impossible. So he did what made the most sense. He turned the craft perpendicular and pushed the acceleration stick forward. The engines roared to life. Crifter was glued to his seat from the sudden and huge change of speed. They sped through the alley, Henrier doing his best not to crash the walls. He held the stick with both of his hands tightly. On the other end of that stretch of alley was another intersection, and to their dismay, more drones. Henrier sped right into them. What are you doing? Crifter shouted. With no reply, Henry R. pressed a button on the console. Two small objects were ejected from the wings. They exploded, creating a wall of smoke right as they entered the intersection. Beeps. Henry R. pushed the acceleration lever back to a near stop. He pushed his stick toward himself, going slightly to the right. The craft turned in the same perpendicular position in the intersection. With mere centimeters to spare, he managed to turn to the right, entering another alley. He pressed the acceleration lever forward again halfway. Shrieks, followed by thumps. They were going too fast, both of them knew that. It was not a matter of if, but when they are going to crash if this keeps going on. Even an experienced pilot would have a difficult time doing these kinds of maneuvers. Crifter was well aware of that fact. He looked behind to see the drones try to find where they went through the smoke. As he flew as quickly as possible through the alleys, Henrier realized something. He made a wrong turn. Dead end, Henrier said. What? Crifter responded. Dead fucking end, Henrier said. Crifter looked forward. A wall was approaching fast. With no time to spare, Henry R. pushed his stick to the right as far as it could, and he pushed the acceleration lever to the max. The engines let out a roar that probably shook the surrounding area as the old fighter rose up. Still in a perpendicular position, they rose up fast. But the wall was coming closer and closer, and just when they were about to hit it, Sky, the two suns that lit the Frindian homeworld, shone their light on the old fighter. To their dismay, this place wasn't empty. It was much wider and gave more space for maneuvers, but there were civilian ships around, and worst of all, patrols. Henry turned the fighter straight. He kept the acceleration lever on max as he managed to dodge multiple civilian ships while going at an ungodly speed. Go to the three hells of Diafall, Henry shouted in frustration as he dodged the ships just barely. He lowered the speed, pushing his acceleration lever down. He lowered the altitude of the craft so as to not be in the way of traffic. If they were caught then, they most certainly are now. Henrier, what the hell do we do now? Crifter yelled at him. I know a way, don't worry, I know a way, Henry replied as he speed up once more, as he was looking around for some kind of turn or way out of the current situation to get out of sight. He saw multiple drones up front, a lot of them. He couldn't go down, he would hit the ground, nor up because of the traffic. He needed to go straight ahead. Crifter, get down, Henrier shouted as he pushed the lever to the max once again. 
He pressed a button on his console once again, revealing a single weapon the fighter had remaining, the other ones being disassembled or rendered inoperable. He pressed the trigger on his stick. Ratatatatatata. The sound of the old kinetic weapon, the sound of the ancient engines being pushed to their limit. Crifter, even though he was absolutely terrified, for the first time in a long time, he felt alive. He felt the youthful vigor return to him. That feeling of vigor was quickly diminished, replaced with another memory. An awful memory. The memory of the enemy having an upper hand. The memory of the fear of losing the men under his command. The fear of death. Beeps, and quickly followed by shrieks and thumps. This time they were metallic in nature, he saw, as the bullets ripped through the metallic frame of the craft and as they hit against the bulletproof glass. But the glass was old. It was worn. It broke. A few bullets managed to go inside. Crifter ducked and was lucky enough to evade them. They somehow managed to go through the storm of bullets unharmed. The craft was damaged and couldn't fly much longer. Diafol had mercy. Good flying soldier, Crifter said. I hope we're nearing, Crifter continued, before realizing the dire situation in front of him. Purple blood stained the cockpit. Henrier looked unresponsive. He was hit multiple times. Henrier, Crifter said. After a few seconds, which felt like an eternity, Henrier winced. He grabbed the stick tightly once again. I am, cough, cough, still, here. He coughed out blood. By some miracle, he was still alive despite the lethal dose of lead. Crifter looked behind. The drones were still on their tail. He needed to do something. He brainstormed through his memories while being a pilot. Then he remembered. Eagle Sky, MKT-13. Explosive Flares His muscle memory did the rest. He pressed a button on the console in front of him. The screen lit up. He pressed the touch screen, which enabled the rear defenses. He enabled them. He pressed the lower trigger on his stick. He hoped to the gods that it worked, and that if it does, that this old hunk of metal was stocked with those flares. His prayers seemed to be answered because, as soon as he pressed the trigger, a flurry of objects ejected from the rear of the craft. Looking back, they looked like ordinary flares. But as soon as the drones came near, boom, 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 the flares exploded almost at the same time, destroying a good portion of the drones and making a wall of smoke. Some of the drones managed to evade that fate and went right through the smoke and continued the chase. Crifter looked back forward. He saw that they were approaching a tunnel. Come on, come on, cough, 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 Henrier said weakly his gaze completely focused on the front, his steady hand now shaking. The drones were getting closer and closer. The small bastards were quick. Soon enough, they were in range for the attack. Beeps. Just a little more, Henrier said, shrieking. Go! Henrier screamed. Thumps. They entered the tunnel, the bullets merely grazing the frame of the ship. Grifter looked back looking if the drones were still on their tail. But to his relief, he saw that they stopped right at the entrance. He sighed in relief. Henrier let go of the stick with one of his hands and pressed a button on his console. This, cough, cough, is Ifkin speaking. Tunnel, six. Do you copy? This is Outpost Frindian Jaegers. We hear you loud and clear. What's your status? Is the passenger all right? Yes, Henrier said. ETA at base one minute. The ship won't last long. Here you land the craft. We're coming over to you. Do you copy? Positive, Henry replied before pressing the button once again. Henrier slowed the ship down and slowly started going down. He no longer had the strength to hold on to the stick. Crifter grabbed his stick and slowly landed the craft on the ground. The ship slid on the hard tunnel floor before grinding to a halt, its engine sputtering out before going out completely. Henry, they're gonna be here soon. Just hold on, kid. Crifter opened up his hatch and got out quickly. He opened up Henry's hatch. He checked his wounds. They were bad. Really bad. It is incredible he managed to hold on for this long. Gods, just hold on. 
Crifter said he knew there is nothing he could do until help arrived. Though he had extensive experience in dressing wounds, he could not stop the bleeding on this. Only with special equipment was it possible to save his life. General, stop this. War, please, Henry said. I will, son, I will. You just hold on, help is on the way. He looked deeper into the tunnel. He could see a pair of lights approach. Henry, you see those lights? That's them, hold on. Crifter said, when he looked at Henry, he was completely limp. He drew his last breath moments ago. He stared at him. So many. One too many. How many died so this would never happen again? He thought to himself. Rest in peace, soldier. You've done your duty well. The pair of lights approached. It was a smaller civilian ship. As it got close, a hatch opened. General, are you well? A person inside said. Yes, yes, I am, but... What's the situation with the deployments? Crifters asked. Sir, we... We're too late. They entered warp an hour ago. If our contacts are correct, the person said. Crifter felt like a, his heart would explode. He felt like he failed everyone, his people, hell, even the humans. Never in his life did he feel this powerless, as he did now. He was a fugitive on his home planet, being shot at and betrayed by the very people he swore to protect at all costs. He was a soldier who lost, felt that he lost the edge. Old age withered the little fight he had left in him. Sir, we need to go. There is still something we can do. We need your help with that, the person said. All right, let's go. Crifter jumped off the wing of the craft, looking back at the old hunk of metal that saved his life, and most importantly, its pilot. Was his sacrifice in vain? No. I won't let it be. Henrier, I'll remember that name. I may not be the soldier I once was. My body is weak, but my mind remains sharp. If brute force won't do, I'll play their game. I'll show them who Crifter and Rydead Perendian is. They took away my brother. They took away my nephew. I won't let them take away my people. I will become the scourge of the gods if need be.